Hello, everybody. My name is Pablo Wojcicki. I'm a faculty member at Northwestern University and the director of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Thank you so much for joining us for today's weekly virtual seminar of the Center. It's really a pleasure to have you with us. The mission of the Center is to create knowledge about digital media in Latinx and Latin American communities across the Americas. Today's speaker is a leading scholar in this space. Dolores Inés Casillas is professor of Chicana and Chicano Studies and director of the Chicano Studies Institute at the University of California at Santa Barbara. Crystal Camargo, a doctoral candidate at Northwestern University and an affiliate at the Center for Latinx Digital Media, will introduce Inés in just a minute. I am delighted to note that this quarter our series is co-sponsored by the Alice Kaplan Institute for the Humanities, the Buffett Institute for Global Affairs, the Center for Global Culture and Communication, the Department of Radio, Television and Film, the Latina and Latino Studies Program, and the Program in Latin American and Caribbean Studies. But before we go to the seminar, I would like to start by acknowledging that Northwestern is a community of learners situated within a network of historical and contemporary relationships with Native American tribes, communities, parents, students, and alumni. It is also in close proximity to an urban Native American community in Chicago and near several tribes in the Midwest. The Northwestern campus sits on the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of the Twin Fires, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Ottawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Ho-Chunk nations. It was also a site of trade, travel, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other Native tribes, and is still home to over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois. It is within Northwestern's responsibility as an academic institution to disseminate knowledge about Native peoples and the institution's history with them. Consistent with the university's commitment to diversity and inclusion, Northwestern works towards building relationships with Native American communities through academic pursuits, partnerships, historical recognitions, community service, and enrollment efforts. Let me say briefly a little bit more about how the seminar will unfold. First, Crystal will tell us more about Ines's research and career in just a minute. Then Ines will deliver her seminar. After that, we will open for questions. Please enter your questions in the Q&A function of the webinar at the bottom of your screen at any point in time during the conversation. Crystal will moderate. At the end, we will deliver some closing remarks. Once again, many, many thanks for joining us. And without further ado, Crystal, the screen is all yours. Hi, thank you so much for that introduction, Pablo, and for the opportunity to introduce today's speaker, who I'm super excited um, to get to talk about the work. Um, much like Pablo already mentioned, Dr. Dolores Inés Casillas is a professor of Chicana Chicano Studies and director of the Chicano Studies Institute at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She is also affiliated with the Department of Film and Media the Center for Information Technology and Society, as well as the UC Santa Barbara Interdisciplinary Approach Applied Linguistics Program. Her research focused primarily on immigrant engagement with US Spanish language and bilingual media, and the representation of accented Spanish and English languages within popular culture. She is the author of Sounds of Belonging, US Spanish Language Radio and Public Advocacy, which came out in 2014 via NYU Press. Um, her first book received two book prizes. Dr. Casillas is also a co-editor with Malia Elena Cepeda of the Companion to Latino Latina Media Studies, which came out in 2016, as well as a co-editor with Mary Beholtz and Jean Sook Lee, both from UC Santa Barbara. Um, and they co-authored a book titled Feeling It, Language, Race, and Affect in Latinx Youth um, Learning. She currently has a manuscript which explores the politics of language learning and language play as heard through different media technologies. Um, today's presentation, which is titled We Speak English to Listening While Latinx to Radio and Sound Media, focuses primarily on immigrant engagement with US Spanish language and bilingual media with special attention given to sound, radio and language play. Um, the format of sound, the low cost of radio sets and its real time capacities have long lent themselves to fostering a sense of intimacy within Spanish dominant 
and immigrant listeners, as argued by Dr. Casillas' earlier work. Likewise, she will share with us today how book audio sets within the learning English market also capitalizes on the practice of mobile listening for immigrant consumers. Her presentation and work at large on listening and sound constitutes two significant yet overlooked areas within Latinx media studies. And without further ado, um, Dr. Um, Casillas. <laughs> Thank you, Crystal. I'm going to start sharing my screen here. Thank you, Crystal, for that introduction. Um, to Mora for doing all the detailed organizational work. To Pablo for his leadership here at the center. Um, for all the co-sponsors that make this happen week in, week in and week out. And for the past year or so, I've used the center's talks here as a podcast of sorts, and I listen to it while I work at my desk. So if there's anybody out there doing the same thing today, I am very happy to be a part of your playlist. Now, I am going to start with a local listening example. Latinx listeners in California's Central Coast faithfully tune in and call into Radio Bronco's popular personality, Lupita Rodriguez, on the 107.7 FM dial. She has a show called El Bazar. So for two hours, um, people call in to broadcast their services, um, to sell used goods, uh, to rent out appliances or rooms and everything that's pitched much, must be less than $1,000. A sample includes, for instance, Ramiro, who sells a refrigerator. Teresa is offering childcare. Josue is available for small house projects. And Ana is taking orders for her choco flan. Teresa, um, Lupita, I should say, reminds listeners as the host to please repeat their phone number, to ask clarifying questions, and she makes sure that people keep their pitch short. She doles out a lot of si Dios quieres and bendiciones, and since the pandemic has become a go-to source on the dial to receive trusted information about workplace safety, mass distribution sites or return to school guidelines, and of course, vaccines. Now I have one minute um, of audio where we can listen to Lupita a little bit her show. A sus órdenes, llamada 13, adelante. Sí, buenos días, Lupita. Dígame, amigo. Este, quiero anunciar que tengo un iPhone 6 en venta. Para más información, me pueden llamar al 805-636-9667. Perfecto, suerte, gracias. Okay, gracias. Hasta luego. A sus órdenes, llamada 14, adelante. Bueno. Sí, Lupita, buenos días. Venga. Ah, mire, estoy anunciando eh, un cuarto de renta. Ajá. Ah, aquí en la isla y Castillo. Eh, este, para mayor informe, llamar al 9. Perdón, perdón, perdón. 805-696-3036. To give you an idea of her popularity, out of the 27 programs that I have recorded, Lupita averages 40 phone calls within the first 32 minutes before pausing for a five minute set of obligatory commercials. El Basad acts as an immigrant Latinx styled on-air Craigslist for listenership that's working class and much more familiar with radio than the internet. These talk-centered shows like El Basad prove that the core of popular radio shows are often audiences. What Elena Razogova phrases as a vernacular political economy where ordinary people use radio for communal interests despite the institutional control. Listening then elicits a sense of intimacy and later feeds into a sense of loyalty for stations and hosts. Now, early radio historians have often told us that the collaboration with audiences is what, is what they really owe towards the survival of radio. So radio for immigrant listeners, even in this digital WhatsApp and TikTok era, continues to be a site of community, podium, and advocate, and often our companion. So when folks hear that I write about Spanish language and bilingual radio, they tend to think solely of musical genres. But my research on radio has long focused on the interaction between radio hosts and listeners 
and how largely immigration politics and the immigration experience of how one's economic and legal vulnerability characterize so much of Latinx listening. I often quote Andrew Krisnell, who reminds us that radio depicts an account of what is happening rather than a record of what has happened. So for the past 20 years, I've been recording and listening to Spanish language radio. I often construct my own sound archives. I monitor social media activity around radio stations to see what kind of engagement they have with political topics. I conduct focus groups to gauge um, listening patterns, and I often look through FCC filings or radio station donations to get an idea of their operations. I also advocate for more archival attention, um, that more archival attention be given to Spanish language radio, given that such few audio actually exists. And I take a lot of joy in mentoring junior scholars who are embarking on projects dealing with radio, sound, or language politics. I truly believe there's so much out there um, that we still need to listen to. So today I'll be discussing some of my writings on Spanish language radio and my next book project on language politics within sound media. I'll focus on one of my chapters um, in that book that looks at the learning English market or how immigrants purchase audio cassettes and CDs to learn English. Now, Spanish language radio, both commercial and community, truly has a rich history of advocacy. In 1930s, LA radio hosts would broadcast weekly union meetings for Mexican garment workers. 1940s, San Antonio radio would have Mexican politicians and musicians um, rallying the diaspora as one. Um, 1960s radio, we'd often hear about the intricacies of the Bracero program. Same thing in the 1980s when IRCA passed, which um, granted uh, citizenship to a million Mexican nationals, we often heard about those details also on the radio. And even here in Pasadena, California, this radio station, Radio Jornalera, is dedicated solely to la day laborers and their rights. Like El Basad, it's this interaction with radio hosts and listeners that gives us an opportunity um, as listeners to listen to guest doctors, nutritionists, teachers, and community organizers. Spanish language radio on commercial, community, low power FM, even Facebook radio have really formalized their role as the go-to place we go to during times of economic and political distress, currently during a public health crisis, and even recently as a site um, to grieve as we saw with the passing of Vicente Fernandez and so many radio stations holding on air vigils. I characterize all this very much so as sound works, what Michelle Helms has termed um, as a way to refer to the entire complex of sound-based digital media that enters our experience through a variety of technologies and forms. Now, trade magazines will often want to explain that the exponential growth of Spanish language radio is owed to the booming, browning kind of population numbers that we have. But I really think that's a little bit too much of a simplistic explanation. If we listen at what is really people, what's gravitating people to radio, we see something different. Now, in 1980, there were just 62 licensed Spanish language radio stations with the FCC, and now there are over 1,500 today. And to place this growth in context, between 1990 and 2000, and this is when Pandora and a lot of other digital darlings came on the scene, English language radio only grew by 10%. So this idea of immigration, which became an increasing topic since the 1980s, really is one of the many facets that owe to its growth. So since the 1990s, Spanish language radio stations have really commanded number one and number two spots in each of the five major radio markets. That's New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, Houston, and Miami. Yet a number one radio station in Spanish at a market like Los Angeles will still receive less in advertising venue, advertising revenue than a number 10 or even a number 15 English language radio station in the same market. 
So despite the institutional recognition by Nielsen Media that Latinx communities are heavy radio users, it is still difficult to court advertisers. Now, besides these commercial markets, there has also been a ginormous growth of Spanish language radio stations and programming in rural areas, and especially what we call the Nuevo South, you know, in the Carolinas. And not to mention the spectacular rise of Latinx podcast, um, which probably merits its own seminar as well. Now, the largest radio format in the U.S. that's heard much louder in the Southwest is the Mexican regional format. So my research focuses on Mexican directed radio stations, but I would love to see more scholars and book length um, studies that also look at, for instance, um, Cuban humor on the radio in Florida and Albert Laguna has written a little bit about that um, or the sense of advocacy of Boricua radio during the 1960s and 1970s as well. Spanish language radio really only makes up about 8% of all radio. But Latinx listeners, really, if they're Spanish dominant or not, um, they make up 16% of all radio listening. And if you couple that with African-American listeners together, they make up a third of all U.S. radio listening. And it's not done so quietly. So the latest reports actually show that Spanish language radio stations gain listeners through the pandemic that more people actually tuned in, which is a trend that was not reflected in English language radio. And I believe that we can um, point to the fact that so many Latinx listeners are also service workers or they work in food industries. So as essential workers, they still were going to work and taking their radio sets with them. Now, it's not surprising to overhear Spanish language radio from the back of kitchens of restaurants, regardless of the cuisine, outside construction sites, or even from hotel housekeeping carts. It's also common to see Spanish language radio stations really cater to their listenership by advertising their call numbers at bus stops or subway stops, because their listeners are most likely to ride the bus or subway to work than actually do like a carpool. The very public nature of most Spanish language radio stations represent a communal and class form of listening experience that differs from more white collar modes of listening, which offer more solitary practices such as um, a podcast or internet broadcasts or anything else with pricey kind of earbuds. So I argue that the format of sound the low cost of radio sets and its real-time capabilities all lend themselves to fostering a sense of intimacy. So over the Southwest airwaves, listeners hear frequent references to la remesa, which is the economic remittances. Callers ask attorneys about paperwork received at the Department of Homeland Security. Guest doctors are asked to translate U.S. medical prescriptions into a familiar Mexican context. Female callers seek the support of pop psychologists in dealing with long distance um, parent uh, child family relationships. These on air exchanges really broadcast the listeners' migrant sensibilities. In particular, I've written about QA shows with immigration attorneys and found that the disproportionate number of callers are women posing questions about family reunification often on behalf of their brother, their father, or a male spouse, really demonstrating how even the work of accessing key immigration information is also a gendered form of work. And I really stress the significance of having radio facilitate access to a trusted attorney where their caller can also remain anonymous. Again, stressing this idea that legal vulnerability is actually a key factor in how people engage with media. And I've written about INS ICE lookouts, and this is when the general public calls in to report sightings of La Megra or Yellow um, to the listening public. It functions as a subversive and sporadic mechanism to help immigrants avoid um, certain public spaces or corners. Code words, for instance, some dated ones from the 1980s, we would hear radio show hosts um, speak about having a migrana, a migraine at a specific corner intersection, or um, people in the 1980s would reference listening to mosquitos, which was a reference to INS helicopters in specific public areas. 
And 10 years ago, a, a public bout of raids hit Southern California and radio show hosts would play the vanilla ice jingle, ice, ice baby, before broadcasting a public intersection live on the air. So here again, not just the importance of anonymity, but also radio's real time capabilities. So since early March, 2020, as so many of us know, there's references to la pandemia, la corona, la rona, el COVID. It's a very prominent topic on radio. I stress this, right, the pandemic and radio because of all the prevalent information we've received about disinformation um, around COVID-19 and how that has spread on digital apps. But yet I've heard community uh, radio, bilingual and Spanish language radio really make serious and concerted efforts to educate the public. It was early on in the pandemic when I heard radio hosts really lament the idea of social distancing. Um, it just didn't translate or resonate well. And when you think about it, um, this is a community that's already disenfranchised and distance is something they're already somewhat used to. So they really tried to reframe it in terms of they, it was gonna be physical distance, but social solidarity. But we saw radio shows started um, adding programs to their schedule about the vaccine. We saw radio programs who um, started engaging with, on social media with listeners, with users, questions. This is one asking whether or not if you miss work because you have COVID symptoms, if you'll still get paid. And this is Don Cheto, the number one radio host in the US who is getting a COVID test that was aired on his YouTube channel and you could routinely, every three weeks or so, we hear him um, as he kind of makes jokes, um, get a COVID-19 test as well. And it's a way to try to encourage and normalize it. Now, there's been English language news outlets also that really celebrate radio's outreach towards Latinx listeners and communities. And they often say that, that they're filling in a language gap or they're filling in a cultural gap. Yet communication between public health officials and the Spanish speaking public have always felt greater than a gap. It's really starting to feel like more like institutional neglect. And I've seen this pattern before here in Santa Barbara during emergency situations. Um, during raging wildfires, during raging wildfires, when there was evacuations here, Santa Barbara County was sending out emergency notices only in English, despite the fact that 36% of our community here is Spanish dominant. Radio Bronco took it upon themselves to translate on the spot, on the air, whenever it received a notice from Santa Barbara County, as well as on their social media site. Now, promotional billboards for radio stations often double as political statements. So this billboard populated the traffic-ridden 405 and five freeways in California. It featured the former top host, Violin Por La Mañana, and it uses a phrase that I used for my title today, we speak English too. It was written in phonetic Spanish to poke fun at monolingual English speakers, and it communicates this lived experience of language here, the language accent and an immigrant syntax that's unique to us. It also demonstrates a very savvy level of cultural fluency in both English and Spanish. Now the practice of listening and reading these messages really privileges those familiar with US popular phrases with specific phonetics and just at also an English only type of climate. El Pelin also used, um, he used to practice his citizenship questions in preparation for his own citizenship exam on the air with listeners. And this brought me to look at another widely referenced experience within Latinx popular culture, which is learning English. My next book project looks at language play across different sound media with one, dedicate, one chapter dedicated to the learning English industry. And here I use learning English to refer to the marketplace of self-learning books and media sets or actually often companion sets that are dedicated to a working class immigrant demographic. 
So not the voice detected software that we see with Rosetta Stone or the smartphone applications that we see with Duolingo. And Duolingo actually targets a much younger demographic as well. But rather listening media like audio cassettes, um, CDs, and the occasional YouTube link. Like radio, listening media here promotes and promises a sense of um, physical mobility because you can listen and multitask. And it also promises a sense of social mobility, this idea that um, learning English is a key self-investment to improving your economic status. Now the learning English market is visibly and audibly apparent in Mexican-based media through television, radio, um, or programmed on our, as ads on our social media feeds. Swap meets in major Mexican cities, as well as communities in the US also offer pirated or secondhand copies of learning English texts. It's really varied. I bought, I have 11 different sets and I bought them at eBay, Amazon, Facebook Marketplace, at a big box store called La Comer in Guanajuato, Mexico, a Walmart in Central California, street vendors in downtown Mexico City, a used bookstore in Chicago, and a free box outside my local library. But the most expensive purchase was a $300 secondhand set of Inglés Sin Barreras that I nabbed on eBay. Now, learning English has long been a political and racialized mandate for immigrants. The commonplace presence of learning English text itself is indicative of a larger public curriculum about English. English is not just a language in the rudimentary sense of grammar and vocabulary, but its immense global privilege and colonial presence has made it what Penny Cook refers to as an ideological named language. Now, these texts really contribute to that ideology by um, this public affirmation when they stress the significance of English proficiency. Inglés para Latinos states in their first few pages, the world has many languages, but English is undoubtedly one of the most necessary. Inglés sin barreras opens with English as the force of unity and as a means of communication. The texts begin quite dramatically before even beginning lesson plans to stress a necessity as if its global dominance was not already painstakingly apparent. And the use of unity that I've seen in so many of these texts really attempts to conceal the institutional pressure and often violent history of imposing English. Instead, English is pitched as this immense economic and personal opportunity. So these texts do not promise um, a written or a verbal command of English. In fact, they kind of brag that you don't need that. Instead, they're gonna offer you key phrases um, for you to learn. In the 1980s, a linguist Woolard coined this as survival English, but nowadays it's referred to more as daily English or situational English. So lessons are organized around commonplace scenarios such as how to request a receipt at a grocery store, how to describe pain symptoms at a doctor's visit, how to ask for a job application, or how to request a translator. Several of these kinds of books also um, coach the reader, the user, the listener into learning how to answer the often asked question, where are you from? Even the popular follow-up question, where are your parents from? So these language learning industries profit from peddling this racialized logic that namely that English will save you. Now, during the late 1980s, it's hard to embark on this project without referencing Inglés Sin Barreras, um, the company that really popularized the text audio learning format. Um, they weren't the first to come out with this, but they were the first to do this massive media campaign um, and so much so that it's still referenced today in Latinx popular culture. Now, part of the symbolic currency that was associated with Inglés Sin Barreras um, stemmed from knowing that it was so expensive. And Char Ullman has some really great writings um, about Inglés Sin Barrera, where she reminds us that Inglés Sin Barreras, to purchase it, you had to negotiate with the salesperson. 
And often immigrants don't have an established credit history, so they have these really high interest rates to pay. So much so that that's why it became often known as these multi-generational or major household purchases. She even cites one example where there's a family that paid as much as $3,000 for a set. Now, this is not the case primarily because technologies have changed so much since then. Um, the majority of accompaniment sets now are less than $25. And now with the accessibility of the internet, we do see a lot more lessons also on YouTube. But keep in mind that audio cassettes and CDs are still seen as really useful because not only their mobility, but because of the fact they don't take up precious data from smartphone plans as well. Today's contemporary version um, of Inglés Sin Barreras is Inglés en Cien Días. It's a three-part audio CD set accompanied by a book manual that's available online on Amazon or bookstores, select Barnes and Nobles, um, select Targets in the US, um, Walmarts, um, both in Mexico and the US and big box stores. It's published by Aguila Publishers um, based in Spain. They do have one office in Florida um, and it was recently acquired two years ago by Penguin Random House. There are 25 different versions of this series. Um, titles include Inglés para el trabajo, Inglés en cinco minutos, Inglés Express, and on and on. So English is plainly equated with a sense of aspirational whiteness, although the content is intended for busy Spanish dominant speakers. And I think one of the covers that always stuns me is the Inglés para el carro here in the center. Um, it really reeks of class as well as these two people are in a red top-down convertible. Um, not the ideal place, I think, to listen to, to learning English lessons, but um, that's how they're trying to pitch this opportunity. So, and in so many of these texts, even outside of the series, um, there's all these photos of, of not just white and white looking people on their covers, but this idea of sheer happiness people have um, engaged in the task of learning English. They also advertise a simplicity around their curricula. Um, there's short audio lessons, lots of visual charts and Spanish led phonetics um, and a very tailored list of these are the most essential phrases for this scenario or that scenario. And they all work together to present second language learning as a leisure task. There's an intent focus on one's leisure or quote unquote spare time and how that could be spent productively by learning English. Inglés para trabajo encourages consumers to listen as one waits for bus stops. El inglés necesario also includes a drawing of an individual mowing a lawn, presumably in the landscape industry, and as he's mowing lawns, he's listening to English lessons. Um, and several other books will remind you to listen in any place you can. So the problem to find time um, is often met with reassurances that this is not bound by place, that you can still learn and be mobile and work and multitask. So leisure is often unfairly seen as a site for what I feel are already overworked immigrants um, needing to keep learning or keep working. Now scholars have shown this growing interest in this idea of digital leisure or digital labor to explain how home-based activities and relationships have changed, mainly due to digital technologies. Now, this is a little bit closer to analog, we'll say, than digital technologies, but the premise is the same. Um, that consumers turn to leisure during idle times. And research has also shown this very interesting gendered component that um, parents or mothers in particular, whenever they find or have idle time, they actually will really elect to choose a family activity that promotes um, some kind of moral or healthy uh, lifestyle. So even when they have time, right, working mothers have even less control really of their own free time. 
Now the insistence to find time also inadvertently blames users who do not complete the 12 set um, series of this or this three pack audio set because they themselves did not find time. However, there are time related privileges involved in having a flexible schedule, a salaried career and or a work from home situation. In each of these scenarios, one is self-managing and to some degree in control of their time. Those in the working class service sector check weekly schedules. They go in when called. They work graveyards and swing shifts and double shifts or they cover shifts. Time is often much more difficult to find when it is dictated by a supervisor or a manager. So I examined the experiences of three Mexican immigrant women who are using Inglés and Sindias, but in particular, their very popular text that prepares people for the citizenship exam. This text has been ranked as high as 15 on Amazon under citizenship prep materials. And today I checked it and it's 90 today on Amazon, which is still really high considering that marketplace. It's also important to note that during the last 20 years, we've actually have seen a decrease in public funding when it comes to not just citizenship classes, but also adult English as a second language courses. So um, at the same time as public funding has increased, the English requirement on the citizenship exam has actually increased. So there's definitely a market need for something like this. Now, Doris, Maria, and Luz have all lived in the US 10 years, a minimum of 10 years. They're mothers to three children, two are single mothers, they're undocumented immigrants in different places on the legal pipeline. They work domestic jobs um, and they are the ideal consumers for a learning English text like this. And I do wanna make clear that I have no interest in seeing if these sets actually work. Like I'm not gonna evaluate their English uh, pre or post. I'm much more interested in their own motivations for doing something like this, um, as well as um, their engagement interactions with media. So I relied primarily on short videos, um, short interviews. I asked them to follow a lesson a day. Um, and it's a two page lesson on the left side is a citizenship exam specific on the right side, there's grammar um, and how to learn different phrases. The audio is three to seven minutes a day. I gave them the option of sending me their impressions through various ways. A lot of them actually like the notes app. So that's what I got. And I naively um, thought that this was going to be a very rich set of data because I had known these three women for five years because our kids attend the same school. So throughout the years, I have driven them to school events. I filled out summer camp forms for their kids. I've translated documents. I've checked out libraries on their behalf. And I even talked to their older kids about college. But these same tasks, which I thought would strengthen this research project, should have also been read as clear early signs that their lives were busy in ways that working class immigrant families are if you don't have a driver's license to drive to events or without a means to remedy a library fine or without enough English to fill out or understand forms. In the end, I did achieve, as Elizabeth Bird argues, the sense that the ethnography gave me a clear idea of what they truly did with this English text, rather than what I imagined, or rather than solely offer close readings. So as we know, research on journaling will uh, warn us that enthusiasm and particip participation will wane. And I saw this after three weeks or between day 21 and 27. So first, they dutifully sent me notes often through the notes application, um, the first two weeks, and then they would arrive with some apologies. Um, and then eventually they would just dictate their notes to me at school drop-offs or pickups when we greeted each other. They did not finish English para la ciudadanía, but it's certainly worth noting some of the very real reasons why. Lou started cleaning new homes and she felt no longer comfortable listening as the homeowners were still there. Doris shared her um, earbuds with her teenage daughter who tended to monopolize them much more. And Maria's husband lost 
a slew of homes on his gardening route. So learning English all of a sudden seemed trivial to her. So despite the book audio sets, I mean, they're packaged as a companion piece, all three women actually use them as separate tools. So opening up the book and listening to the lesson at the same time limited one's ability to multitask. So all three women treated the book lessons as a stationary pastime and the listening portion as more of a mobile activity. Doris and Maria kept the booklet in the kitchen, one on top of the microwave and one in the fruit bowl, and Luz kept it on her nightstand. They figured that if they waited for something to boil or cook, they would just pick up the booklet in the kitchen. Yet they admitted that these fleeting moments were also shared with the television that was on nearby or the need to fold laundry. In many ways, the idle time that they found were competing with household tasks or homework prep. Luz had planned to go over a daily lesson when in bed after the kids um, went to sleep, but admitted that she tended to rush through it because she was really anxious to scroll through El Facebook, which to her was this real leisurely activity. After 105 days, when our set 100 days concluded, um, I met with them together as a group, and I heard these women blame themselves for not completing the 100 lessons. They reasoned that it was por floja, I wasn't uh, motivated, I was bored. They viewed this unfinished task as a reflection of their own poor time management and a lack of motivation without considering their mounting, often fluctuating work and family responsibilities. And also when you think about the timeline of studying for a citizenship exam, when right now Mexican nationals can wait as long as 15 to 20 years for that exam to take place. Um, it didn't seem very motivational to study now when it seemed like such an unclear um, timeline ahead. Now Latinx populations, and Jonathan Rosa writes about this, are routinely defined through a racialized space-time narrative. Spanish evokes ideas of pastness. And immigrants are seen as stubbornly Spanish dominant, um, as recent arrivals are less likely to assimilate. They're designated in the past tense, a very past tense that evokes also ideas of being unproductive. And second and later generations are often championed for being bilingual, English dominant, and they're viewed and framed in these promising futuristic terms. But let's keep in mind that domestic wages often do not require English. And all three were part of this loosely tied collective of house cleaning. They mostly relied on their older children to text with the employers um, in order to set up some schedules. But when I asked Maria, you know, you've been here for at least 10 years, you do interact with employers. Um, we had this discussion about what phrases she knew. She could rattle off lots of different phrases and conversationally in English, but she really underestimated her, her English language comprehension and her own speech because it was tied to this idea of house cleaning of the domestic sector. So these texts in a lot of ways, what I found is they're not just selling these essential phrases in English, but they're selling this idea of having this imagined conversations with fellow English dominant speakers. In much the same way in which accented or non-English language speakers, they often bear the communicative burden in conversation with English dominant speakers, these texts place the rate of success, um, successful English acquisition on Spanish dominant speakers. Now, given my own experience um, of watching my immigrant mother learn English through VHS tapes, I knew the task was neither quick nor easy. I remember my mother fielding questions in public by strangers openly inquiring about her legal status during an acute anti-immigrant moment in California. And largely they asked about her legal status because they heard her Spanish dominant speech or they heard me help with translations. We also spent evenings at the kitchen table reciting the Pledge of Allegiance as I helped her prepare for her citizenship exam. 
these learning English texts and learning English experiences often structure many of our own childhood memories and impact the politics, I think, of fellow second and later Chicanx and Latinx generations. In another chapter in the book, I detail how language play within short videos and memes lovingly defend the Spanish accent of English that we hear within our immigrant families. Now, both radio and learning English texts are an important component of Latinx media studies. By focusing on these markets, media and cultural studies scholars can also gauge larger English-only politics, the political economies of different media, viral videos of linguistic bullying, and institutional shifts in the U.S. citizenship exam or immigration law. And the many ways how immigrants listen, even when larger institutions do not. And I'm going to end there um, and thank everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Casillas, for such a, a rich presentation. Um, I will start us off with a Q&A, but for our participants that are watching us, feel free to Put your questions into the chat box and I will make sure to ask them to Dr. Casillas. Thank you. Um, I felt like I, I personally connected to some extent with some of this material because my family are immigrants and I remember in the late 90s my parents having an Inglés y Barreras mm -hmm. um, and thinking about your presentation just reminded me of like it, it was like an encyclopedia. It was as expensive as an encyclopedia and it was massive. So it was really interesting to hear how much that has shifted over the years. But I guess my like first question is, what kind of got you interested in this work? I know you kind of mentioned a little bit about your mom, but why study language? Um, that's a great question. I actually, I didn't put two and two together about my mom until I was already knee deep into it. And I was like, oh my goodness, I, I was 15 when that happened, right? So like, I have these memories of that. Um, but I think what really started it off was I was at a store in San Francisco and I picked up a book and it was called The Nanny Translator. And I thought it was a joke. And I asked the person, I was like, is this a joke? And she said, no, that's the last copy I have. And I opened it and it was actually a text for English dominant employers on how to communicate with their health. And they, I was fascinated with it. I bought it actually. I still have it with me. I, I have, I make copies of certain pages and we read it and talk about it in class because um, some of the instructions aren't necessarily nanny related, right? Um, or some of the questions really assumes the questions about green cards, questions about vaccines, um, questions about using bleach, um, all these other different questions. So then I just started discovering an entire area of that. Then I was fascinated with Rosetta Stone being so expensive um, and then Inglés in Barreras. And then when I went to, I was in Mexico in 2017 for four months, learning English was just shoved down everybody's throat. I felt like in popular culture in the schools that my kids went to there. Um, so I really started getting very interested in why people gravitate towards it and how. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective on that. We have one question from um, Arcelia Gutierrez. Her question is, I'm wondering how waves of Central American immigration since the 1980s has impacted the landscape of radio in Southern California. Have you encountered this in your recent radio research? That's a great question. Um, one of the most popular radio hosts in Los Angeles um, was El Cucuy, who spoke both Mexican slang um, and a lot of uh, dichos hondureños. So he was from Honduras and he was such a rock star. One, because Spanish language radio hosts are considered rock stars in their own right. But in particular, after um, a horrible earthquake in Honduras, he did a fundraiser in LA for the community in Honduras. Um, so a small community in Honduras actually renamed themselves um, Renan Coelho after his real name. Um, I think 
no one has really explored how a Honduran radio host, what he did to kind of bridge this Mexican and Central American um, gap, I think in Los Angeles. Um, so he was really popular in the late 1990s and early 2000s. He was let go because of a controversial incident. I think that's the reason why everyone's let go now um, in radio, there's a controversial incident that takes place. Um, but since then, the only thing I could really think that really engages Central American listeners or scholars, I feel I've heard that more on podcasts. Um, but in recent Los Angeles, um, I haven't heard it. And part of that is because Don Cheto, who is like the poster child for Michoacan, is so dominant that I'm, I'm finding it hard to listen to more Central American stories because of him. No, that makes sense. I didn't know El Cucuy de la Mañana was from Honduras, and I grew up listening to him. So that that was, I don't know, it was really interesting to hear how you even see those dynamics. We also have a question from Mora. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Casillas, for this wonderful and really inspiring uh, presentation. I have two questions. Um, my first question is related to whether, and this is something that I'm curious about, whether WhatsApp audio messages uh, can be explored in your field of research, uh, whether you're considering including as material for uh, your exploration, WhatsApp audio messages. That's my first question. And my second question is related to uh, whether you see any significant differences, I'm assuming yes, between how people, how Latinx um, uh, people listen to radio and how they listen to podcasts. Uh, and I wonder whether that, whether incorporating podcasts as a, as a content uh, uh, with which to compare is something interesting to do or not, whether it's, it's actually too different and not related to its dynamics or whether it's actually creating some intimate way of relating to the content or whether actually podcasts are actually about what's already happened and not actually about what's happening in the present time, which is what you said about the radio. So I have those two questions. First, WhatsApp audio messages and then podcast. Thank you very much. Yeah, no worries. So a proposed chapter actually is on WhatsApp. It's actually looking at exchanges between uh, my mom communicating with her comadre in Aguascalientes. Um, so it's really helpful to live with a 77 year old immigrant <laughs> um, in terms of media engagement with immigration. Um, I have to tell you that's the only chapter that's yet to be completed. And that's because her comadre, my madrina, died of COVID in um, December um, 2020. So I have, I have to really revisit that morally and ethically about, um, about how my mom's going to feel about that, to be completely, utterly honest. Um, but the audio messages is something that we notice right away. It's so much more commonplace to do audio messages um, on WhatsApp than anything else. In fact, a lot of Mexican users will ask me, like, I don't understand Facebook Messenger. Like, you can't use audio. Like, why would anybody use it, right? And Facebook Messenger is only used more than WhatsApp in the United States, Australia, and England. So there is something innate about this sense of talking, speaking, listening, right? Um, that it's really, really popular in Latin America. And as you know, now there's phone carriers in Latin America who are downloading WhatsApp when you get a plan, right? It's, it's built in. It's like your calendar here, <laughs> you know, it's a built in kind of app. Um, but I'm fascinated by the audio messages. I'm also fascinated by all the visual, like, um, especially for immigrant demographics, like you get like a picture, of, in, you know, un, uh, los flores, te da los bendiciones para el día, like God bless you today, buenas noches. Like, I don't know why I have to receive so many of these every day, but it's important for people to send it, right? Um, so I'm really kind of interested in that sense of like daily aspirations and daily languages that we also see really exchanged in WhatsApp. Um, to answer your second question, um, I think that a lot of immigrant users have not gravitated to podcasts, a lot of older immigrant demographics in the same way that younger Latinx audiences have. 
I do think that the Latin uh, Latinx audiences that we appreciate podcasts and we gravitate to podcasts in higher numbers because we have that um, normalization of listening at home, right? Um, and actually, um, Diosa, which is the second half of, of a Locatora Radio, um, has this beautiful story where she got interested in Latinx podcasts because she remembers listening to radio in the car with her father, right? So I do think it's, it's definitely something generational that we've learned that they've impacted and influenced each other. Thank you. We have two more questions. One of them is from Mirna Garcia. She says, Mil gracias for your dynamic presentation. Dolores, comment. I appreciate how you shared your positionality and relationship with the mujeres. I am struck that the mujeres blame themselves. I appreciate how you name the complex forces and oppressive conditions at play. It's easy to assign blame or remedies on the people themselves rather than naming and addressing this complex web of power structures. Question, I'm wondering if your work has encountered or explored indigenous language speakers, um, for example, Guatemalans grappling with Spanish and English. Um, not in terms of indigenous speakers, um, and I didn't mention this, but there was a couple examples. I actually uh, look at, um, but not as extensively as Carlos Jimenez, who's somebody who's doing a lot of really great things with indigenous radio, Carlos Jimenez. Um, but Mixteco Radio is actually on the on very popular on the rise in California, um, in Fresno, and even nearby here, Santa Barbara and Oxnard, California. So Radio Indígena is where uh, 94.1 FM or Radio Indígena um, com, or I just like them on Facebook, and that's the Facebook radio station I listen to is Radio Indígena. They're the ones who often explore um, grappling with both Spanish and English, like both hegemonic languages and their lives. Um, they also um, translate. So it's, it's, they're doing relay translation, something in English gets translated to Spanish, something in Spanish then gets tra translated to Mixteco. So if you're interested in that, I think that's a really great topic. And I would definitely look at Radio Indígena as a really prime example of how they're doing it with another indigenous community. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective on that, Dr. Casillas. We have one more question. Well, we have several. Let's see how much we can get to. One of them is, what is the future for audio storytelling and content creation for Spanish speakers in the U.S.? I am so heartened by the rise of Latinx podcasts. I mean, it just makes my heart sing. And December, I'm just <clears throat> doling out $50 and $100 everywhere I go, just because I want to, this is what I want to support, right? This is what I want to see. Um, so I think that audio storytelling in Spanglish code switching form, I see that on a spectacular rise. I know that we often point to Radio Ambulante um, out of NPR, a Spanish language uh, radio podcast. It's a fantastic produced show, um, but they do something where um, I would say maybe, I don't wanna quantify it, but not every single show deals with a US Latinx or an immigrant perspective, right? There's some shows that are exclusively based on Latin American context. Um, and also they provide their transcripts because they want to be seen as a tool for non um, Spanish speakers to use the podcast to learn Spanish. That kind of teaching tool um, doesn't feel as in house for US Latinx audiences. So I think that maybe this idea of something that's more playful with language, I think that is gonna be the, the future of audio storytelling. Awesome. We have, I don't know if we have time for one more question. I think it might be quick. Yes, 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 yes. Let's do this one, Krista, thank you. This is from Luz Ruiz. 
Um, they say, thank you for a wonderful presentation. I noticed in one of the slides, the radio hosts named themselves comunicador or comunicadora and was wondering if you see a significant difference between oh. assuming a role as host um, huh. and a comunica comunicadora or comunicadora. A comunicadora is um, more of a formal way of saying that I am going to just moderate something. I'm the moderator to make this happen. The locutor, locutora is like, I am in command of this airspace, right? Um, and I think more people, um, it's a little bit more lighthearted when you have a locutor, a locutora, um, even though it stems in a Latin American sense is much more of a, a professional kind of business role. Here in the US, um, in Spanish, I've seen locutor be you're a professional, but you can, you can have a more of a lighthearted personality. Um, but that was a great catch, Luz. That was a really great catch because I've been really interested in how people are, are deviating just a little bit by calling themselves comunicadora. Thank you so much, Ines, for this great seminar. Thank you, Crystal, for terrific moderation. As always, thank you to our audience for great engagement, for staying with us through the end. Uh, so I want to invite everybody to join us next week for the next iteration of this seminar. And uh, once again, thank you very much, Ines. This was absolutely superb. So oh, thank, um, you. thank you for the well, invitation. Our pleasure. And uh, everybody have a great rest of your weeks.